It's a privilege to come before you again today so we may be edified together by God's Word. As you know, this is the first Sunday after Easter, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, um, which is a day where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and His victory over our sin and death and all evil. Today, we're starting a new sermon series on the victorious Christian life. Uh, we want to discover what it means to walk in the light of that victory that Jesus Christ won. Uh, this morning I'll be preaching from 1 John about walking in the light, and next week uh, Pastor Paul will be preaching about trusting God's will for our lives in difficult times. So the passage today is 1 John 1, 1 through 2, 11. So let me read that. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that... God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Son. Thank you for the Spirit that you send, that we may be together, that we may have unity, that we may understand your word, that it may be illuminated in our hearts and in our minds, in our souls, Lord, to walk according to what you have said. Spirit, I pray that you be with us now uh, to convict us and to explain in our hearts the meaning of this text, so that we may walk a certain way, so that we may act a certain way, and love each other. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Lord uh, really brought this passage home for me this week as I was thinking and studying the passage. Uh, I was praying that the Lord would make it real and true for my own heart, so that I could share with you all how this truth has edified me. First uh, John is written to new believers or young believers and uh, our passage is sort of a flowchart for deciding how a new believer should act but it is also the test and examination for mature believers to make sure that their walk is according to God's word that is the right uh, way to live according to their salvation um, and so I wanted the passage to uh, really be meaningful to me, and the Lord provided an opportunity for that. This week I received a, a message from my youngest brother, Josiah. I have two brothers, and the youngest uh, is named Josiah. 
and he's faced some difficulties in his life. Uh, he had to bear the brunt of my parents' divorce seven or eight years ago. All of his high school years he spent in the middle of a tug-of-war custody battle um, between my parents. Um, when he got to college, uh, graduated high school, he wanted to enter the Army ROTC officer training, um, which my other younger brother went through at Baylor. Um, the only way he could do that at Baylor was on scholarship, and uh, he didn't qualify for the scholarship because of an ear surgery that he had had during his high school years, and so he didn't get the medical waiver for that. Um, so he had to stop going to college and is just now, he's working and trying to figure out what's next in his life. Um, what does the Lord have for him? And he messaged me this question, uh, what does God mean by his yoke is light? Because I feel as though I'm living the proof that that statement is wrong. And I can sympathize with him. Um, the question on his heart is, the question that, that we ask as believers, how can we live the victorious Christian life? How can we sing the Easter songs, you know, up from the grave he arose, and uh, talk about the victory that Jesus had, and then have that victory be reflected in our lives? And thankfully, I think John addresses that in the passage, <coughs> First John. First John, written by uh, the same John, as far as we know, who wrote the Gospel of John. Um, and so, these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, are really cool in that they're sort of a cliff notes for the big gospel that he wrote, which is, you know, more than 20 chapters, um, condensed into this little letter that he is writing to uh, new believers, a young church. John is concerned, as we can see at the beginning of the chapter, with uh, the gospel and the fact that he is an apostle. Um, what it meant for him to be an apostle was that he was an eyewitness to Jesus Christ. He was a physical uh, witness, testimony to what Jesus Christ did and who he was. Um, and he doesn't get away from that. Um, often John is called mystical or very uh, theological. His gospel is talking about light and darkness and life and death and um, water and the spirit and blood and, and things like that. But as an apostle, he was also very concerned with uh, empirical evidence, with what he could see and what he could hear and what he could touch, and that's what he says here at the beginning. Um, I think he did that on purpose. Another thing that uh, my brother Josiah messaged me was he said, I just never really understood the whole blind faith without sight thing. How does anyone know what to believe in if none of us have a clear picture? I think one of the things that comes to us as, as believers is why does our situation not match this truth? How come we go to church on Easter and sing about all this victory, and then in our lives it doesn't appear to be that way? Um, it seems like God is asking me to take something blindly, but John, right away, right out of the gate, says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen, what we have touched, um, this is what we believe in. Um, and not only believe in it, but we proclaim it. The things that we have received, that we have, that has been revealed to us, we pass on. So, I want you to think of this passage as we look at it. There are a lot of different parts. Um, the sentences kind of come uh, one right after the other. But if you can think of it as sort of a, a flow chart for Christian living, or a decision tree, um, or even like a, when you call a company and they're too busy to talk to you as a real person, and so you get the the, the phone tree. If you would like to talk to the you know, accounting department, that's one. If you would like to talk to the CEO, hang up, because you're not. Um, so you can think of this passage, even though there are a lot of different parts of this passage, it's sort of a checklist. If you're saying this, you should be doing this. If you see this, but you don't see this, then this is this, the situation. And so I want to go through it that way, um, and sort of intersperse between this flowchart decision tree um, are little tidbits of the gospel, summations of what the gospel is and what it means for us and what it should look like in our lives. So hopefully that makes sense and I'll try to abide by that. So let's look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Um, here we have sort of his big manifesto 
about the gospel and about his experience with Christ as an apostle. I think John wants to point out to us that there is a certain order, there's a certain process to becoming a good Christian, becoming a believer, and living the life of a believer. Um, you don't get to skip any steps. You don't get to test out of the steps for the Christian life. Um, you can't just like move right past confession right into glorification. There's a certain order to things because of the way that God's made it. And so John is illustrating that with what he says here. And then there are two uh, big important things I think he says here uh, that give us the purpose of why he's writing and the purpose of why he continues to preach the gospel. Um, there's so that phrases here. In verse 3 it says, so that you two may have fellowship with us. So one of the purposes of his uh, proclamation and purpose of writing this letter is so that there could be fellowship among these believers. And that's why you would write a letter anyways, right? To sort of communicate, to open up uh, ways of fellowship, of, of knowing each other. And then there's another so that statement here that verse 4 says, so that our joy may be made complete. Uh, so even as an apostle, someone who knew Jesus, uh, John's joy isn't complete until he has passed on the good news that he has, until he has passed on the truth and seen it at work in other people's lives, until their number is, is full. He uh, has deferred his joy. He's delaying his gratification in the gospel until he can share and fellowship with these new believers. So we're all like my brother Josiah, I think, uh, at a crossroads as believers. We can choose to hold on to our experience which is not as eyewitnesses of Christ, which is not, uh, unless you're a time traveler. Any time travelers here? Okay, I didn't think so. Unless you lived and walked with Christ, you have to decide, am I going to keep his word? Am I going to accept uh, the word of the apostle, the scriptures that I have? Or am I going to be convinced by my situation? Am I going to give in to uh, what I see and what I feel and what I hear that seems contradict what God says. Um, and that's really not an old, uh, or that's not a new thing for believers. As believers, young or old, we should expect this question because you could phrase it another way. Has God really said that you can't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden? Mm -hmm. We've heard that before. Genesis 3, the snake begins to talk to Adam and Eve, um, bringing into question what God has said. So the challenge is not God hasn't given us anything to believe in. The challenge is, are we going to stick with what God already told us? Are we going to believe that? Are we going to live by that? So, we can look at verse 5, which gives us uh, very explicitly, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So, we have sort of been posing the question, you know, how can we live the Christian life in the midst of difficult circumstances or in the midst of uh, doubt or in the midst of uh, a lack of evidence? How can we have fellowship with God? But John, I think, sort of turns the question around to start out in verse 5 and says, how can a holy God fellowship with sinners? So how can God, who is light, who doesn't abide darkness, bless you who are in the realm of sin, who are in darkness. Where is the connection there? Where is the fellowship there? And so we uh, have this gospel that explains to us how those two things can happen. How can God be light but also uh, be the one that we trust in, the one that we come to for life? Um, so we have this uh, beginning of the if-then statements, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So in verse 6 we see there is a huge emphasis in this passage on what we say, what we confess, as we'll see later. Um, so what we say has to match not only the truth, but what we say has to match our actions and match how we're living. Um, and so we have verse 7 which says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. In the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. So there we are. If what we say matches up with what we walk, with how we walk, if we walk in the light, we acknowledge the truth of God, that God is light, that God is light and that we're sinful, then there's this way. The blood of Jesus cleanses us 
from our sin. And now we can have that fellowship with God. Verse 8, uh, another if question. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have two different things. You can either say that you don't have sin, but John says, if you say that, then you're a liar. And really, you're fooling yourself. Or, verse 9, you can say that you do have sin. You can confess your sin. And when you do that, that opens, the, that begins this process, this order that God has set up for you being forgiven and for you being cleansed. So today I want our concept of confession to mature. I know that when I say confession, my pride recoils. Uh, when I say confession, part of us wants to hide. Part of us wants to be stubborn, to resist or act like uh, confession isn't for everyone. Uh, some people can do confession. That's good. That's good for them. But we don't all have to confess. I mean, you know, uh, I, like, I like other parts of the Christian life besides confession. When I say confession, it's hard not to feel accused, like you've been caught, uh, like you're a criminal. Um, but the fact is, we are criminals. Right? God said to walk one way, and we walk the other. God told us to wait, and we grabbed it and said, God, uh, like a parent spoon-feeding their child, has put provision into our faces, and we reject it. We spit it out. Have you ever seen a baby do that? Like, you put food in their mouth. You're like, oh, good, that's good. They got it into your mouth, and then it just all comes, like, dribbling out. <laughs> they got, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I'll put it in my mouth, but I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to receive it. So we're the same way. And so when someone says confession, we are condemned. We are condemned. We are guilty. But that same divine judge has arranged the plea bargain. We confess our sin. We confess the Lord's goodness. We confess our sin. We have the privilege of appealing to Jesus' payment of our penalty. We confess our sin, but we also point to the Father's pardon. And that pardon is Jesus Christ. So, in fact, the only platform for properly confessing your sin is the grace of Jesus Christ. Don't confess your sin without confessing the sovereignty of God. Don't confess your sin if you don't also confess the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. Don't confess your sin if you're doing so out of a sense of mere social guilt. Don't confess your sin if you're only apologizing for yourself. Don't confess your sin unless there is some way to get rid of it. Get rid of it completely. So I used a different metaphor actually in the first service, but if y'all let me preach a little, um, this morning I was getting ready for my sermon, and uh, that preparation involves spiritual preparation, mental preparation, but also uh, bodily preparation. So I was making my round, headed to the restroom, you know, to get ready, do everything, put my tie on and other things. And uh, we're on the eighth floor, right? Our office is on the eighth floor. So I got in there to the eighth floor men's bathroom, and I walked into the stall. And wouldn't you know it, the bowl is full of solid waste. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'll, and I walked into the next stall. It too is devastated by a plague of fecal matter. So I surmised, um, these toilets must be clogged. Because I know that no one did that and then forgot to flush the toilet. I know, I know that they flushed it, but it must be clogged. So I had a decision to make. Right, as you do. I'm sure, raise your hand, no. <laughs> I know everyone has faced this situation. And I had a decision to make. I had a decision to make. I could just pretend like it was someone else's fault and do my business in the bowl and leave it there, right? Without any way of getting rid of it. Or I could walk down to the seventh floor where the toilets are working and get rid of that stuff. My point is, we can't pretend like our stuff doesn't stink. We can't pretend like there's things in us and about us that need to be got rid of, right? And so when we, whether it's out of our own inability to deal with sin, or it's our own denial of sin, we want to be self-righteous so we pretend like it's not there, or whether it's out of our, our ignorance, uh, you know, as new believers, oh, we're concerned about all these different fun things. We like to worship and we like to pray and we like to read the Bible, but we're forgetting about the sin that is at issue. Um, and we 
live as if sin isn't there. But that must appeal, appear to be a very foolish thing to outsiders, right? Just like, you know, if I pretended like toilet worked, even though it obviously didn't, right? That stuff is still there. The stuff needs to get gone. We need to get rid of it. We need to deal with that. And God gives us this way of getting rid of that sin. God calls us to that confession. We don't get to skip it. We don't get to test out of confession. But God really dignifies us in giving us this method of dealing with sin, of facing sin, of engaging sin. And so our concept of confession is that of proclaiming our foolishness before God and our reconciliation to Him. Our conception of confession is that of not just one time when we got saved, but over and over again, admitting our pride and the Lord's humility, admitting our failure and Christ's victory, admitting our incompetence and Jesus' perfect obedience. And when we make this good confession, the night passes, the darkness is over. When we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, we confess it to God and we proclaim it and accept it to ourselves, and we proclaim it to our neighbors, then we can begin this restoration, this reconciliation of fellowship with God. We don't get to skip that step. And so we come to chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, uh, that talks about this way of dealing with sin. It says, I'm writing that these things, uh, writing these things to you so that you may not sin. John is also concerned that we do not sin. And he says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. John can so boldly address the issue of our sin because he knows the gospel, because he knows this truth. Um, he can put it out there. Chapter 2, bam. This is written to you so that you may not sin. But if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Because when we deny our sin, something else has to be the problem. Why are we all here if there's not sin? We have to come up with some cause. We have to come up with some issue to rally behind um, try harder, and, and just like a blind person, we're looking everywhere for, for something to be concerned about. Um, we often deny that, we don't deny that something is wrong, but we often deny that what's wrong is sin, what's wrong is ourselves. So we are not to deny sin, and we're not to hide from sin. One of the main tenets of a Christian life is engaging sin, is dealing with sin. Uh, the victorious Christian life is not fleeing uh, from the field of moral struggle, not fleeing and getting rid of the thought that we need to deal with sin, uh, which often happens. We try to take the shortcut and pretend that we, we're over sin. Sin is good. Sin was it. You know, I, I used to sin, but now I'm good. I read my Bible, so I'm good. But the victorious Christian life is standing firm on Christ so that we can deal with sin. So our testimony is different. My testimony is not that I was misguided at some former point in my life and then I read some books and I listened to some great speakers and I'm all better now. My testimony is not that I struggled hard for the first part of my life, but now I'm in the Word and I'm praying and I go to worship services and all my problems are behind me. My testimony is that I gave in to sin. My testimony is that I betrayed Jesus Christ. My testimony is that I tried to take over the throne of my heart from God. I tried to live as if sin could help me out, as if sin could give me what I wanted. I gave up my freedom to eat from any other tree in the garden just so I could have that one fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. I tried to orchestrate my own goodness according to what I heard and saw and felt. I tried to arrange my own righteousness without paying attention to the real theme of God's righteousness. And I also testified that God doesn't stand for that. God does not abide sin. He is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And those who do rebel die. All the betrayers are executed. And that sounds harsh, but that's the only way to live. We have to be rid of sin. We have to be rid of that evil. We have to be rid of that thing because it stops our fellowship with God, prevents us from getting to our joy. So my testimony is that the Son of God knew that sin was the problem. The Son of God loved me apart from my sin. He didn't confuse me with my sin or didn't collapse me into my sin. 
The advocate, Jesus Christ, made sin the problem. Jesus fixed his hate, not upon me, but upon my sin. And he didn't solve the, the issue of sin by separating himself from sin, but he became sin, as 2 Corinthians 5 says. He engaged sin. He met sin on its own grounds and dealt with it. So he became sin who knew no sin. Jesus Christ the righteous conquered sin from the inside. He conquered through sin and remains our advocate now for us as believers at the right hand of God. So how can we pretend like sin isn't the problem? How can we talk about ourselves as the victims of our life? Oh, life is so hard. Oh, things are happening to me. Why do the righteous suffer? Right? That's what the psalm says. Why do the righteous suffer? But we're not righteous. <laughs> right? Like, that's a valid question, but I'm not righteous. Um, so we need to ask the right question. We need to look at this from the right perspective. Jesus Christ will not be swayed from the reality that sin is the problem at our salvation and for the, our daily walk. John the Apostle won't let us forget about sin. Um, but that's because Jesus Christ has done everything that we need to be rid of sin. And in fact, it's fellowship with him that is our victory over sin. So we turn to verse 3 of chapter 2, and we are back on the, the flow sheet, the decision chart of the Christian life. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So we have, if we keep his commandments, then we have come to know him. Verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him, um, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. So, we have, uh, and here, through uh, verse 8, um, John is talking about love. There is a purpose to God's salvation. There is a purpose to this fellowship. Often as uh, new believers, as young believers, um, we are in a mood to praise God. We are in a, an attitude of, of worshiping God. And we love singing songs and writing poems and painting paintings about the greatness of God and sort of reveling in the gift that we've received from, from Christ. But that gift that we receive is an investment. It's an investment in us um, that we might proclaim that truth to others, that this love that we have received, we might love our brothers and sisters as well. And so there's a test. If you really have received this message of love, then you will be loving your brothers. You will be loving your neighbor. You will be loving those around you. And then John says some things about an old commandment and a new commandment. and <clears throat> It's a little bit confusing. And you might be thinking, I thought we were done with commandments. I think I preached on this last time. I thought if I was a believer in Jesus that I wouldn't have to worry about all that obeying the commandments stuff. I could just kind of love and forget about obeying. <clears throat> Excuse me. So John is, is sort of straightening out and says that there's this old commandment. And I think what he means by old commandment is the commandment to love your neighbor. The commandment to love your neighbor was in the Old Testament. Um, it was the reason that uh, uh, the Lord has all these things for us to, um, sorry, <clears throat> my voice just got really dry all of a sudden. The Lord is concerned in the law that we treat our neighbors uh, correctly, that if there is a grievance that there's a way of addressing that. If there's a loss, that there's a way of paying that back. And it's so it's uh, the thing that leads Jesus to say, he sums up the law, right, with love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the old commandment I think John is talking about. But the new commandment is how we can obey these commands. The new commandment is this confess the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for our sins. The new commandment is not that we have to make some sacrifice, that we have to provide something. Um, but in fact, God provided Jesus Christ so that we can obey this commandment to love our neighbor. So we're at uh, verse 9 through 11, um, ends our little flow chart of the Christian life, um, and ends with a, a note of warning. 
Um, if we look at verse 11 especially, it says, But the one who hates his brother <clears throat> is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So there are consequences for choosing not to walk in the light, for choosing to skip confession, to try to uh, leapfrog over this necessary process of confessing and proclaiming the truth of God in the midst of our sin. And that's if you're walking in light and you're denying that light, then you're headed for failure. You're headed for a fall. Um, verse 10 says, The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. If you're loving, loving your neighbor, then you're not going to stumble. You're not setting yourself up for a fall. You're um, abiding in the light. You're receiving God's provision. You're strengthening yourself in the gospel. But if you're rejecting that revelation, then you're becoming weaker and weaker. You're trying to do it in your own strength. Um, and that's part of my testimony as well. I uh, was saved from an early age, <clears throat> baptized, and um, when I was deciding what I wanted to do with my life, you know, I wanted to serve God, I wanted to serve the Lord, um, even before I graduated from high school. <clears throat> and so I knew I wanted to go to seminary and do something Ministry, like ministry related, be a leader in ministry. And so I got to college, um, and it was hard. Uh, I had bad habits. I didn't know how to study. I didn't uh, know how to hold down a job in the right way. Um, my solution for everything was isolating myself and trying harder and staying up later or reading some other book, hoping that if I gained enough knowledge, the problem would solve itself. <clears throat> and it got so bad that at the end of my college career, the semester I was supposed to graduate, I actually failed three classes. I had to go home, tell my dad, uh, I'm not graduating this semester. Um, and that was good for me because my life broke. I was setting myself up for this stumble, setting myself up for this fall because I wasn't abiding in the light. I wasn't letting God have influence in my life. I wanted to do the right thing, but it was because... That was how I thought I would uh, gain prestige. That was how I thought I would find purpose in life. I would seek validation with my own hand. Oh, Jesus has done all of that, but let me prove my character. Um, and that didn't work out. I eventually ran out of steam. It just doesn't uh, do the trick. And so I had to learn this process, this order of recognizing the revelation of God's provision and confessing that saying, letting God know that he's right, I believe you, but also letting that into my heart, and then also proclaiming it to my neighbor, proclaiming it to the people that I know, so that the Lord is glorified by my work, because um, the Lord is going to let those things fail which don't glorify him. Um, he doesn't sanction those things. He doesn't support those things. So that's my testimony, and that's why I can identify so closely with my brother at this hard point in his life. But the best way that I can love him at this point is to share not my tips and tricks for getting through college, <clears throat> not to sort of bestow my wisdom um, of my life experience, but in fact to testify to what I've seen and heard, to proclaim this gospel that has saved me and allowed me to live the life that I can live to glorify Him. So I can love Him and actually fulfill the gospel. I can love as I have been loved by shining that light. And in fact, it's God who's shining through me and revealing Himself through uh, even the hard circumstances of my life so that other people can see that it's not my strength that got me through, but in fact, it was His. Um, and so that's what I pray for you guys as well. Uh, I had a, some people come after the first sermon to ask some questions about how do you live the Christian life. Um, often, as believers, we saddle new believers with all these obligations and duties, and we say, oh, you have to get up at 5 a.m., and oh, you have to read through the whole New Testament in this week, and oh, you have to go do a 40-day fast, and oh, you have to you know, cut your hair and... and not wear lipstick or something. I don't know. We, and I'm like, where are we getting that? Where is that coming from? Where, you know, I didn't read that here. What I do read is that if I confess that God is my provision, I did read that if God has revealed himself to me, 
then I can live, then I can prosper, then I can live this victorious walk. And when I take that message to heart, that deed of love that Christ accomplished, when I take it to heart, now I begin to love in the same way that he loved. And so I pray that not only will we all take this to heart so that we can have fellowship with God, but that we proclaim this message to each other so we can have this fellowship with each other instead of throwing up barriers between us, like, oh, you have to jump over this hurdle first. Because uh, that's not even what Jesus did. So, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for uh, sending your Spirit to bind us together in unity. I pray that we would walk in the light together. I pray that our duty, our, our obedience would be to know the magnificent joy that we have in you, that we'd invest it in fellowship with you, we'd invest it in fellowship with each other, that the good news of Jesus Christ might be proclaimed over and over again. This faithful testimony of the Apostle John might be spread to the end of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for what we have. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.